It's wonderful to be with you for this occasion of the proclamation of the gospel and the worship of the Most High God. This time of fellowship we have with one another in this effort. I certainly enjoy those two songs that we've just, well, all the songs, but uh, those two consecutive songs that I don't believe I've ever heard before. You were mentioning the one, I, that one we just sang, I had not heard that one either, but both uh, wonderful, uh, certainly scriptural songs with powerful messages, uh, messages we all need to heed, and certainly messages that really go along with uh, what we're speaking about throughout this meeting, and particularly uh, tonight. You see, there is no better place on earth to be than that which is based in heaven. The church of Christ, and by that again, we're not talking about a denomination, one among many denominations. We are talking about the church of which you read in the Bible. The church of Christ is indeed based in heaven. It is spoken of as the kingdom of heaven. That it is... That is, it is ruled from heaven by the divine king. The church of Christ is spoken of as the bride of Christ. People talk about a marriage made in heaven. And when one is entered into this relationship that is found in the body of Christ, in the church of Christ, he truly has entered into a marriage made in heaven. The church of Christ is spoken of as the house or the family of God, 1 Timothy 3.15. The church is spoken of as the body of Christ. We think about the close and intimate relationship that all our parts or members have with each other. We think about how you know, our head might desire something. So our head say, I'd like to go somewhere. And so what happens? They send a message to our feet, and our feet take our head where it wanted to go. Or our head might say, hey, that food looks pretty good, and my head's been seeing a lot of that over in this room back here recently. But it says, I want some of that food, and so it tells your hand to bring that up to your head where you can put it in it. And so you see that close and intimate relationship, and it's described in 1, Timothy, or 1 Corinthians 12 as the intimate relationship in the such a sense as whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice. And that speaks about the different members that would be found in the body of Christ, and particularly of the relationship between the members and its head. When we are in the body, we have that kind of intimate relationship with the head. But all that being said, we need successively to enter into the church then. Jesus said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Matthew seven twenty one. And so we seek to enter into it, but there's limited access. The means of entrance into the church is through Christ. Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go out and find pasture. John 10, 9. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And so we have to go through Christ. But when one has entered into the church of Christ, he is actually said to be in Christ himself. And so what has Christ said are the means of entrance into his church, this undenominational church, the church of which we read in Scripture. The first thing that must be done is here. Romans 10, 17, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. That's an important passage that everyone needs to keep in mind. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But note how that verse starts out. It says, so then. So we understand that that is not a verse that just stands completely by itself. That verse is summing up what has been previously said. It is the conclusion to an argument that has been made. And we go back to verse 13 of Romans chapter 10. Where we read, for whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That speaks then about salvation. And whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. Shall be saved. 
we're talking about entering to the Lord's church, but salvation is a blessing found in the Lord's church. We read in Acts 2.47, the Lord added to the church daily those that were being saved. And so there weren't some that were being saved but not added to that church. There weren't some added to that church who were not being saved. When you talk about the church and you talk about those who have been saved, you're talking about an identical group of people. Salvation is a blessing found in the Lord's church. Again, as we find in Ephesians 5.23, Christ is the Savior of the body. Again, that singular body, that singular church, Christ is the Savior of it. But here in Romans 10.13, it says that we must call upon the name of the Lord to receive this blessing. Well, what's this phrase mean? Some latch upon, they say, call upon the name of the Lord. Well, that means to pray, pray to the Lord. But it doesn't say call out to the Lord. It says call upon. And additionally, it says the name of the Lord. The name is not the person himself. But note when we look at this term then, this phrase, what it means. Call upon the name of the Lord. This expression is found in Acts chapter 25. We find Paul being judged there by Festus, but various Jews are trying to get him brought to Jerusalem for a trial. Why? Apparently so they could ambush him and put him to death. At the very least, it would be a kangaroo court there. We'll read Paul saying in Acts 25.10, Paul said, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat, where I ought to be judged. To the Jews have I done no wrong, as thou very well knowest. For if I be an offender, or have committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. But if there be none of these things whereof these accuse me, no man may deliver me unto them. I appeal unto Caesar. So there were Jews that wanted Paul brought to Jerusalem. This Roman procurator of Judea, Festus, said, why don't you go to Jerusalem? But Paul said, I'm going to appeal to a higher authority. As a Roman citizen, I have the right to appeal to Caesar, and that I will do. I appeal unto Caesar. That word, translated there, appeal to, is the exact same term that's found in Romans 10, 13. Call upon. As one looks at uh, Acts 4, verse 7, Acts 4, 11, and 12, we see that the name stands for the authority of someone. Just as someone who would be told to open up in the name of the law, open up the door by the authority of the law. I have the right of, by the authority of the law to tell you to open up that door. And so when somebody then calls upon the name of the Lord, he appeals to the authority of the Lord. Here are other influences. Here are other authorities trying to get you to do something else, but you say, I'm going to appeal to the authority of the Lord. That's what it means. But how can we appeal to the authority of the Lord if we do not know what he says? That's the question that goes on and is asked. Again, as it says in verse 13, For whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall appeal to the authority of the Lord, shall be saved. Verse 14 of Romans 10, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? How are they going to do that? How are you going to believe something you have not heard? We need to hear the word of God if we're to know what it says and to obey it. As we will see in just a moment, faith is essential to entering to the body of Christ. Galatians 3.26 and other passages. But we're told in Romans 10.17 that what produces this faith is hearing. Faith cometh by hearing. God is not going to take over your mind or your body and make you believe. You are not going to believe something that you have not heard. And if we're going to hear correctly, the hearing must be of the word of God. Jesus said, take heed what you hear. Mark 4 and verse 24. 
We need to be careful about that. We need to use filters as to what we read, what we hear, what, all, all things that we receive into our minds, but especially when we decide what we're going to believe and obey. Because if you only hear the wrong thing, you can only believe the wrong thing. And if you believe the wrong thing, you can only obey the wrong thing. And friend, if you obey the wrong thing, you can only be added to the wrong church. Jesus said, beware of false prophets, prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Matthew 7 15. Why be so careful? Why be so cautious about that? Because they might tell you lies, you might hear them and then believe them and act upon them instead of believing and acting upon the truth. They're false prophets. They're not speaking the truth. So you need to be careful about what you hear. And you also need to be careful how you hear. As Jesus said, take heed what you hear. Jesus said, take heed how you hear. Luke 18 and verse 8. Or Luke 8 and verse 18. In... Matthew 13, as we find the parable of the sower being given, Jesus would speak about that, that first group that the seed would fall upon, the word would fall upon. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth not, standeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. And so somebody can actually hear the truth. But for various reasons, it's not bringing forth fruit. You can go, we could go through the different types of soil. We find that only one out of the four was successful. Which one? But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it, and bring forth fruit with patience. Luke 8, 15. <laughs> and so we have to have that honest and good heart, that willingness to conform our lives to what the word says, even if our life does not already match up to what God's word has to say. We need to have that kind of honesty. So we need to take heed how we hear. Once you have heard the word of God, you have been given a wonderful opportunity. Think about that day of Pentecost when the kingdom, the church of our Lord was first established. When those present said, men and brethren, what shall we do? What, what prompted them to say it? Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And so they had heard the truth. Those who had been guilty of the crucifixion of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ were pricked in their hearts. They were changed. Seeking out their soul's salvation. Why? Because they had heard. We previously looked at that Ethiopian eunuch, one of whom it may have been well said he was a, a dry tree, estranged from participating in the worship of Israel in so many ways, not to be admitted into the congregation of Israel, but yet he traveled all that way from Ethiopia to Jerusalem simply to worship, to have whatever part in it that he could. Of course, we know that he was returning and then Philip the evangelist was sent to him and we read then in Acts 8, verses 35 and 36, that Philip began at that same scripture. Isaiah 53, where the eunuch had been reading. Philip began at the same scripture, opened his mouth, and preached unto him Jesus. And so he was hearing the preaching of the word, the eunuch was. We read then in the following verse, And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Folks, these are people now seeing the opportunity for salvation, one that never even occurred to them. It had never occurred to them to seek salvation in Jesus Christ until now. The Pentecostians, because they heard it, they're now seeking salvation. The Ethiopian eunuch has heard Christ preach. He's seeking salvation. Acts chapter 16 introduces us to a Philippian jailer one who was involved in mistreatment of Paul and Silas, an apostle and another faithful preacher of the Lord. But yet we're told that the Lord 
sent an earthquake that loosed everyone's bands. And then that jailkeeper, he came and saw it that everyone's bands had been loosed and he was about to kill himself before Paul and Silas stopped him. He was about to commit suicide. We see a godless man who would take his life so lightly to go ahead and destroy it because the prisoners had escaped. But when he saw that they were alive, we're told that he came trembling. And asked that question, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And we come down and we read in verse 32 that they preached unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. He's hearing things that he never had heard before. And following his response to what they were preaching, we're told that he rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Verse 34. What a change has come over this man. But what made it possible? The hearing of the gospel. The Corinthians, as wicked as they were, to Corinthianize was a synonym for to become immoral, but yet we read in Acts 18.8, many of the Corinthians hearing, believed, and were baptized. Friends, you have been blessed during this week with the opportunity to study the Word of God all these times. And, and I'm not saying that to boast of myself. I, I'm not talking about myself. But just the simple fact that we're coming together each night to study God's Word together, it's, it's a blessing to me as well. We're all blessed with that opportunity. It's an opportunity to grow in faith, to draw closer to God. But perhaps some may not be as regular in their attendance after this. Perhaps some may not be studying the Word of God as often as they should. While the door to the church is always open, as long as there is life and the Lord has not come again, but yet still it can become distant and obscured if one is not hearing the Word of God. We see that door coming close to these people when they heard that word of God preached. What a blessing is it is to hear. And we see that it is essential to hear, to enter into the church of Christ. And also one must believe. We read in Hebrews eleven six, 6, But without faith it is impossible to please God, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And so you must believe in the fact of God, that He is, that He exists, and that He is a rewarder. And so you must believe in the promises that He has made. Believe that what He has said is true. You need to have that faith. And particularly, you need to have faith in the promise He made of Jesus Christ, His Son. Believe His Son is who He said He was. We read in Romans, or excuse me, John 1 and verse 12, but as many as received Jesus, then gave he power, the right to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And so one has the right. What essentially has what you might call in a sense a ticket that's not yet been exercised. As someone might register to vote, but he has not yet voted, but yet he has then that right to vote once he is registered to do so. One has that right to become a child of God when he has believed. As we read in Galatians 3.26, for you're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus, you can become children of God by believing, by having that faith in what? In Christ Jesus. That Jesus, the man who was born of Mary, was indeed the Christ, the prophesied Messiah. And as we read in Acts 8 and verse 36, we're told about that Ethiopian eunuch who had spoken about, you know, see here's water what doth hinder me to be baptized. Well, Philip answered him, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And so it was essential. He could have, I guess, gone to the water for a little swim, a little bath, but it would have been to no avail to his soul's salvation. If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Believeth what? The prior verse had said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. 
And in the context, we see that many people had failed to believe that Jesus Christ was risen from the dead. You go and preach the gospel. Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the Son of God. There is salvation to be found in Him. We need to believe that. Believe that gospel, that good news, as it's described in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We need to believe that. As Jesus said in John 8, 24, if you believe not that I am He, or that I am, the eternally existent one, ye shall die in your sins. And so we need to have faith in Jesus Christ. We're not going to enter into the church of our Lord until we have that faith. But that faith in and of itself does not place us in the church of our Lord. Not the church we read about in the Bible. One must also repent. Acts 17.30, God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. All men everywhere. Friend, that's you that's me. That's everybody who's not here tonight. That is everybody. You see, sin is something of which we are all guilty. As I read in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all failed at times. We've all done that which is not according to God's will. We find the definition of sin given in 1 John 3 and verse 4, that sin is the transgression of the law. Sin is the transgression of God's law, of what we find being said in the Bible. And we've left that. Now if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. 1 John 1 and verse 8. But sin is something of which we're all guilty. And sin separates us from God. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither is ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. God has the power and the ability to save. But when we sin, we separate ourselves from that ability. It's, it's not a diminishing of his power, we just simply have separate ourselves from that power. Sin will do that to us. The Apostle Paul said, I was alive without the law once. When the commandment came, sin revived and I died. There was a point at which he became accountable to God's law. As one who grew up while the law of Moses was still in effect, he became accountable to the law of Moses. But so for one today... As one reaches that age of accountability, he'll do eventually that which is wrong and spiritually die. Spiritually separate himself from God. But when we enter into the church, we enter into the place where God dwells. As is said to the church, ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk with them. I'm going to dwell among you. You, the church, are my dwelling place, 2 Corinthians 6, 16. That's where I'm going to be. But, but sin cannot be there, can it? Again, Ephesians 5, 25 and following, Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And so notice how the church is going to be. It's going to be without spot, without wrinkle. Any of these blemishes, that's what sin brings in. That's what worldliness brings in. And that's simply not going to be where the church of our Lord is. And so... Since it's the case that sin is something of which we're all guilty, and since it's the case that sin separates us from God, and since when we enter into the church, we enter the place where God dwells, it follows that to enter into the church, we must rid ourselves of sin. Now ultimately, ridding ourselves of our record of sin, the sins we've committed that have stained our souls, we're not going to be able to do ourselves but there is something we can do and must do, and that is to repent. As was said to those on the day of Pentecost, who said, men and brethren, what shall we do? You know, a lot of people say, well, 
There's nothing you can do. What, what do you deserve? But Peter still said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Your sins can be remitted. But what are you going to have to do? You repent is one of the things mentioned. You make that change of mind that you're not going to continue in sin any longer. That you are instead going to walk in the ways of the Lord. 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 10. Godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. And so when we have that sorrow, that same kind of sorrow about the, our sins that those there on the day of Pentecost did, well, it can bring about that change of mind. Say, <laughs> sin is no way to go. That's not the what we want to continue in. And so let us put it behind. And that brings about salvation. Jesus said, I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Luke 13, 3 and 5. And so we have to repent. We have to do our part. And if we make up our minds to do our part to enter into Christ's church, Christ will do His. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Acts 3.19 You repent and your sins ultimately will be blotted out as you have been converted. And so repenting it's something we must do if we are to enter into the church of Christ. Also, one must confess. We read in Romans 10.10, 10, For the heart of man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And so we see that confession is something done with the mouth. That is, confession is something we say. But what do we say? The previous verse says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And so confess what? The Lord Jesus. In 1 John 4 and verse 15, we read, Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. That's the same confession that the eunuch would go on to make. When he was told, that if thou believest with all thy heart, thou mayest be baptized. That eunuch said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Acts 8, 37. That's the same confession that we need to make today. And Jesus gives us great assurance if we're willing to make that confession. We're told, for whosoever confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But, Whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. Jesus says, in effect, if you want me to confess you in the there and then, you need to confess me in the here and now. Not everybody is willing to do that. We're told in John 12 and verse 42 of certain who believe in Christ. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed in Christ, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. That was their choice. Each of us makes his or her own choice. But if we're going to enter into the church, the body of the saved, we're going to need to confess Christ. And we're going to need to be baptized. All these steps that we have mentioned to this point, these previous steps, hear, believe, repent, and confess, they all culminate in the step of baptism. Notice that Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. They're both linked by a coordinating conjunction. Believe comes first, but then comes baptism is also mentioned. We noted in Acts 2 and verse 38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Every one of you needs to do that. And Galatians 3, 26 and 27 read, for you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus, for as many of you as have been baptized in Christ have put on Christ. 
It's interesting that as Paul is explaining what it means to become a child of God by faith in Christ, he explains it by saying, well, you were baptized in Christ. You didn't just stop by believing. You continued. It is at the point of baptism that one enters into the church. The question had been asked, what shall we do? Peter told them the answer, repent and be baptized. We read in Acts 2.41, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. There was no one who gladly received his word then who refused to be baptized. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day were added to them about 3,000 souls. Added to them. When? When they were baptized. At that point they were added unto them. Unto what? The church is the church that's being founded on this day, this day of Pentecost. If there be any doubt about it, verse 47 again, the Lord added to the church daily those that were being saved. That's what they were added to when they were baptized. It's the point of baptism that one enters into the church. As Jesus spoke about the need to be born again, he said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Again, that kingdom, which is the church, what are you going to have to do to get in it? You're going to have to be born of water. Water baptism and the Spirit by the teachings of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 2, 13 and following speak about the fact that the Spirit has inspired this word that we have here before us. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, that acknowledge that the things that are around here are the commandments of the Lord, 1 Corinthians 14, 37, we have the inspired spiritual word right here, and we're born of it when we do what the Spirit has said, and when we are baptized for the remission of our sins. Again, Matthew 28, 19. Baptizing. Go. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, that is, into the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Baptize them there. Folks, if you study your Bible honestly, it's very clear that it's at the point of baptism that one enters into the church. But why is it that people so ardently oppose the requirement of baptism? You can go out and talk with people and you talk about the need of faith, those who profess some type of faith in Christ, those who are aligned with some type of church, these denominational churches. They won't argue about the need of faith. Oh yes, faith is essential. You've, you've got to believe to be saved. You go on to speak about the need of repentance. Uh, you know, they may not exactly agree, but they're not going to fight with you about it. You talk about the need of confessing Christ. Uh, okay, what I mean... They may not teach it, but they're not going to fight you on it. I've read a lot of things that speak against the, the teaching against baptism. They, they just despise that, but it's only that. Why is it that Satan and his ministers fight baptism so much harder than they do the other steps? For the very reason we've noted. If all you do is hear, Satan still has you. If all you do is hear and believe, Satan still has you. You can hear, believe, repent, and even confess, but if you have not been baptized, Satan still has you. You are not yet where the Lord is. You are not yet where salvation from sins is. Satan is still has you. And that's why the fangs, the claws come out as soon as one says you have to be baptized. Folks, that's ultimately Satan underlying that type of response. One needs to be baptized to enter into the body of Christ. But before you enter into the Lord's church, you need to count the cost. Luke 14 record, records of large numbers of people following Jesus Christ about as he was preaching, as he was doing great works. But Jesus spoke about the heavy requirement of discipleship. And he went on and said in Luke 14, 28 and following, For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest happily after he laid the foundation is not able to finish, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. You know, why start to build this and spend all this effort, spend all this time, and you don't finish 
He goes on and makes then another illustration. Or what king, going to make war against another king, consulteth not first whether to be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000? Those are some odds that's pretty tough to win. He says, or else, if he doesn't have a chance, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassador, ambassador and desireth conditions of peace. He's going to count the cost. You see, a lot of people have some type of unrealistic expectations about what entrance into the Lord's church, what becoming a Christian will do. Simply because you enter into the church of Christ does not guarantee you a lifetime free from heartache. And neither does it guarantee that you will be saved when your life is over regardless of what you do. You've obeyed the gospel. That doesn't mean you're free to do whatever you want after that. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Hebrews 4 and verse 11. Many have fallen along the way. Many have failed to enter into it. The Christian life is a life devoted to the service of the Lord. Jesus said, Whosoever shall come after me, let him deny himself and take his cross daily and follow me. Deny yourself. That doesn't mean it's all about getting from me. It's saying you're denying yourself. You're taking up your cross. You're willing to suffer for my cause. Romans 12, 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service. A lot of people might kind of look at the different sacrifice, the animal sacrifice that I offer under the Old Testament and say, boy, that must have been challenging, that must have been tough. But we, as Christians, are told, you offer yourselves. Your bodies. A living sacrifice, not just the dead sacrifices that they would offer. Folks, that's quite a cost. And if you enter into the Lord's church, you will have a higher level of accountability than one who has never become a Christian. Second Peter 2, 20 and following. For if after they have escaped the pollution of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That is, they've heard the truth, they've obeyed it. But after that, they're again entangled therein and overcome, has fallen back into sin. It says the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. It's worse. It goes on and says in verse 22, It has happened to them according to the true proverb. The dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. And so, friends, that's a high level of accountability. It says it's worse <laughs> if you have known it and then gone astray than one who has never known it. So you need to count the cost. But at the same time, you need to count the cost of a decision not to enter into the church of Christ. Friend, you have a higher level of accountability just because you have heard this sermon tonight than one who has never heard the gospel. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty one and following, Woe unto thee, Chorazin! Woe unto thee, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, wicked, pagan, Tyre and Sidon, Jesus says, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon the day of judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, the place where Jesus had made his headquarters during his ministry, and thou, Capernaum, which art exalted into heaven, Jesus had been in their presence, he had performed miracles among them, art exalted into heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in you had been done in Sodom, Sodom, it would have remained until this day. That is, if Jesus had been there and performed miracles, Jesus is saying, they would have turned from their wickedness and they would have, such would have remained until this day. But, saying you have it, but shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. God has given us a conscience. 
And that conscience that helps us to understand what's right and what's wrong. It can even prick us as it did those on the day of Pentecost when they knew that they had done wrong. But if we continue to ignore that conscience, what happens to it? 1 Timothy 4.2 speaks about a seared conscience. Seared, calloused, incapable of receiving that kind of feeling, incapable of receiving that desire to do the will of God. Jesus, or Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord, Ephesians 4, 17, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Vanity? Mind? God has blessed mankind with a mind. It's, it's useful. It's a tremendous tool. But something happened to make their mind vain and useless. Having the understanding darkened being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of their blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, indicating at one point they were not past feeling, but who, being past feeling, have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. They decided, I'm going to ignore what the truth says, and so at this point, I am now past feeling. James would say, go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow we'll go into such a city and continue their year and buy and sell and get gain, whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor, a little puff of steam, that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that we ought to say, we ought to say, we need to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now you rejoice in your boastings, that is your empty confidence that you will be, you are the master of your destiny, that you will do whatever you want as long as time goes on. <laughs> False. But now you rejoice in your boastings, all such rejoicing is evil. Therefore to him that, to, that knoweth to do good, that is to the one who knows to make things right with God and does it not, who knows to obey the gospel and does it not, to him it is sin. Jesus would ask the question that every human being needs to ask. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world? Everything. The best job, the best house, a wonderful family. What is a man profit if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Folks, you sacrifice that soul. If you know what you need to do and you choose not to enter into the church price, if you choose not to obey the gospel, friends, there is no better place on earth to be than in the church of Christ. There is no comparable place. It is where salvation is. It is where Christ is. And it itself is the means of entrance to heaven. 1 Corinthians 15, 24 speaks about that final day when everything you see will be no more. Then cometh the end when Christ shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father. That is, the church is going to be delivered to the Father. But those who are not in it will be excluded. Christ is the door, and He has given the means of entrance. He has shown us that we need to hear. We need to hear truly the Word of God. And we need to believe it. We need to believe that Jesus Christ came from heaven. He died for our sins, but He rose again. We need to repent of our sins. Say that there's something better than continuing in this mire and muck of a life, but to walk in the blessed and pure way of the Lord. To confess the name of Jesus Christ. One that we ought to be glad to say, whoever might hear it, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And to finally be baptized. To resist the pull, the temptations, the lies being whispered by Satan and his ministers saying it's inconsequential. You can just be baptized because you've already been saved. That's not what the Bible teaches. You be baptized to be saved. You be baptized to be added to the Lord's church. And you can do that this very evening. Do you need to do that? Or if you've already entered into the church and you've not been faithful to it. Have you, you need to make things right. 
if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, 1 John 1, 9. But if you are of that accountable age, you've reached that age of, age of accountability, you've sinned, you know what you need to do, you know you need to obey the gospel, what is stopping you from obeying tonight? Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come unto him and sup with him and he with me. Revelation 3.20. Friend, you can have that in the church of the Lord and ultimately you can have that through eternity as that church will be delivered up to be with the Lord. If we can assist you, come. As together we stand and sing the song of invitation.